The primary purpose of this podcast is to educate and inform. The views, information, or opinions expressed by hosts or guests are their own. Neither the show nor any of its content should be construed as investment advice or as a recommendation to buy or sell any particular security. Security-specific information shared on this podcast should not be relied upon as a basis for your own investment decisions. Be sure to do your own research. The podcast hosts and participants may have a position in the securities mentioned personally through sub-accounts and or through separate funds and may change their holdings at any time. Welcome to This Week in Intelligent Investing, where we examine timely and timeless investing topics to help you become a better investor. Enjoy authentic, unscripted discussion featuring Phil Ordway, Elliot Turner, and other thought-leading investors. Brought to you by MOI Global. And now, here's your host, John Michalczewicz. Welcome to a new episode of This Week in Intelligent Investing. Great pleasure to have you with us. Also, a great pleasure to welcome my co-hosts, Elliot Turner and Phil Ordway. We have a great show ahead. Elliot, let's start with you. All right. Thanks, John. Hello, everyone. So here we sit, largely done with the third quarter of earnings reporting, and it's been a wild one in terms of the dispersion between the winners and the losers. And it's basically exactly the opposite of what last year was like. So flip it on its head um, in terms of the winners and losers. And one of the things I've been thinking a lot about is the challenges from both an operating and an investing perspective of forecasting the trajectory of a business, both near term and longer term, uh, through and coming out of COVID. And you regular listeners know I've been a big uh, believer that a good chunk of the change wrought by COVID is structural and will persist out of this. Um, though the rate of change, there's been a bit of not just course correction, but or not just a change in the rate of change, but you know a bit of course correction in the trajectory of that change. And so right now, a lot of people are gra- are, are struggling with you know like what does normal look like one or two years out from now, even while most places, many places are still, you know, without a sense of when normal will return. You know, we're recording this on the uh, eve of Austria reinstating their lockdowns, even for vaccinated people. So as much as normal is being grappled with in the stock market, you know, we're still fending for what normal looks like in, in real life in a lot of places. Um, where I sit here in Connecticut in the U.S., I think, you know, we're at a much greater degree of normalcy than um, in a lot of other places around the globe. And, you know, there there are definitely uh, different degrees of that, depending on where you are in the U.S. You know, I think people in Florida would say, geez, we're really uptight here in Connecticut. So, you know, there's a pretty big spectrum uh, in the U.S., um, but, you know, it really hit me when I was looking at Peloton's earnings and the fact that even within their business, a very slight change in, the, in, in, in where they expected your end subscribers to be, connected fitness subscribers to be. And mind you, they had already guided for their full year. They're on a different fiscal year than the calendar. A slight change brought a big uh, problem for the business because they had they had rise in their expense cost base in order to accommodate what they thought was going to be a little more persistent demand that followed COVID. And we could parse through the nuances of that. Some of that is like, you know, the, the bikes themselves doing okay overall, but the demand for treadmill not getting the uptake they expected. So let's leave that aside. The very nature of sitting in the operator seat and having to forecast your business and manage your expenses accordingly it's very easy to get stuck in a position where you're entirely over your skis. And conversely, it's very easy to get stuck in a position where you don't have nearly enough inventory to feed into what's happening. And I think that's a good chunk of what's happened in supply chains. And so, you know, as supply chains stay tight, one of the things I'm thinking a lot about is heading out of this, we are going to have a lot of companies that both, on the one hand, they'll invest in a more diverse, more robust supply chain with a lot more ability to follow what's happening, but also a lot more inventory in all parts of the channel in order to keep themselves uh, 
it, to keep an ability to service demand, even if things get back to this sort of hairy state. So, you know, heading into COVID, I think we'd had about 30 years of supply chain optimization and just-in-time manufacturing. And here we are where, um, you know, there's a there, we're learning there's a flip side to that. And this is all in the wake of, uh, you know, I think uh, the trade wars and all the change that that brought. Um, so, okay, to pull this all back to where I started, the ability of people and the ability of operators and investors alike to forecast where businesses are going, I think, has as little clarity right now as has ever happened. And I'm you know, wondering, I think one of the things I wanted to introduce to you guys as I struggle with what the consequences of that are and what that means for the next few months. Um, you know, I, I feel like it would be better to start the conversation, ask you guys that question. How do you think about the lack of forecastability and what challenges that brings to operators and how you think about it with your investor hat? Well, it's funny because I actually changed my mind uh, a couple of hours ago about what I was going to talk about today. And it's exactly this topic with, I think, a really vivid example of this. So I'll save it for then. But I will answer your question by saying that it's a great point. It's something I think about all the time. And to be honest, my answer is that I don't think anything has ever changed. And I think the inherent unpredictability of the world and business results and securities markets was just as high two years ago as it is today because we don't know what's right around the corner, right? I mean, the insurance market was as risky on September 10th, 2011, as it was on September 12th, 2011, and the difference was in between. We realized that people weren't being prudent with their long-term pricing decisions, right? And that's basically how I feel today. You know, you look at all these businesses in the last few months that have been absolutely waxed in the public markets. Peloton is an example you just brought up. And it's funny because that's one that I talked a lot about last year. And, and on the basis of these results, like you said, it was a very slight tweak in their business assumptions. And the stock fell by 50% in one day, 5-0% one day, fell by half. And look, of course, people that, you know, the people that started the company, not only have they been cashing out along the way, but they've still made multiples of their, any original investment that was made in the early backers has still done really well, of course. But the, the problem with all these things, right, is the people that came later and bought along the way are getting absolutely killed now. And you're right. I mean, we don't know what's right around the corner. We don't know how that business is going to perform coming out of COVID. We don't know what the supply chain is going to look like next year or in two years. But that's, you know, just life. I mean, that's that's how businesses go. And that's why I think it's so insane when you layer on aggressive assumptions on top of aggressive assumptions. And I've said many times on here, of course, that there's no investment advice implicit at this, but I think having a 13.1% estimated average life of a subscriber on that platform is just insane. They have no idea how long their subscribers are going to stick around. And when you're that aggressive, you know, it's just like paying a high price or, you know, putting some crazy growth rate into a DCF, the tiniest little tweak can make the whole thing collapse as, as we're seeing now. So uh, that's my rambling answer to your good question. Yeah, I would just add, I, I, I do feel like in some ways it's become harder to forecast for businesses and, and, and also to invest, I'd say, as long as you're investing in certain types of companies. I'll give you an example. You take the shipping, the ocean shipping companies, um, and you look at what's happened to the Baltic Dry Index. It's been just incredibly volatile this year and i don't think anyone knows where it goes next um so it does feel like um just the disruption that's happened due to covid um you know has kind of pushed companies or pushed um kind of supply toward a very precarious situation but then it can swing very quickly the other way as well. And you get some huge swings um, in pricing. You know, you can take lumber as well as, as an example. There are many others. But I think it becomes very difficult for companies to budget and plan um, if they are in a low margin business or if they're um, financially levered. Um, where, you know, they need certain types of cash flows to service their leverage. Um, and so as an investor in some of those kinds of businesses, it just becomes much more difficult, I feel, um, 
to kind of handicap the probabilities. Uh, but, you know, as Phil correctly pointed out, you know, the world has always um, been uncertain and unpredictable. And this is just another manifestation of that. And, and actually, Elliot, I didn't address one good point you made, which is, and we've talked about this a little before, but I think one clear implication or consequence of this is going to be a reinvestment in global supply chains and, and onshoring things. Because like you said, I mean, it, it's just, uh, it, the world's hard enough. Business is hard enough. You can't predict what's coming with as much certainty as maybe you thought you could. And so one way to remove some of that uncertainty is to reinvest in your supply chain, whether that entails locating production a little closer to distribution or backing up your modes of distribution or, uh, you know, th there's lots of ways to go about it. But I think that is pretty much inevitable uh, that a lot of companies that have stretched their supply chains to be so thin and so brittle are going to reverse that decision, and rightfully so, in my opinion. Yeah, part of what's becoming clear to me, you know, I do think you, from an investor's perspective, it's comfortable to say like, hey, I don't really worry too much about the predictability of a business. But when you're operating, you definitely need a degree of predictability, especially when you're running a just-in-time supply chain. And so a consequence of what you're saying effectively is that companies need to have more uh, working capital, right? They need to have more inventory and they need to invest pretty heavily in a um, at least new methods to manage their supply chains. And so that's both a big investment cycle and a period uh, and, and more capital in the business. So you're talking about compressing returns on invested capital on coming on two fronts imminently. And it effectively looks to me like going forward, we're about to contend with a second big wave of change because of that. And there are going to be a second big wave of winners and losers because of that, because different companies are going to be able to solve problems uniquely and different companies are going to have new problems emerge out of that. And it could really shake things up in a pretty profound way yet again. And I know we've talked about all of these things before, but I think it's becoming particularly acute as some of these companies get over their skis and not understanding the, not being able to forecast their own businesses and have to do things that, you know, Peloton saying we're not going to raise capital as the first answer to the very first question on their earnings call. And then within a couple of weeks, raising capital like this is um, a consequence of an environment that's incredibly uh, complex and uncertain. One thing I'd say about the capital raising point, and this is just something that sticks in my craw about corporate governance in general, is that's just malpractice in my opinion, because look, I understand it's a forward-looking statement and they can very credibly claim under the laws as they're written that that wasn't a violation, but why would you ever, ever do that? I mean, clearly the market was relieved that they raised capital to alleviate the, the fairly obvious liquidity concerns that were going to emerge over the next few quarters for reasons that you just brought up, right? Inventory and working capital, chief among them. So why would you ever say publicly to the people that you're supposed to be partners with that you don't need to raise capital? And then two weeks later, you turn around and raise $1.1 billion of dilutive equity. I mean, that, that to me is just unforgivable in, in a sense, because you either should have had that capital raise before the earnings call, or you should have punted the question until the capital raise was done. It's not like that thought hadn't crossed their mind two weeks ago. So that's just absurd. But back to your original point of, of the difference between operators and investors, I do agree. I think generally speaking, being in the operator's shoes is harder than being in the investor's shoes. But I, I think the analogy extends to investors as well, because I think you're right, just as you need to potentially invest more in physical plant distribution, supply chain, working capital inventory type line items, I think investors that maybe thought they had the world by the tail LTCM style need to consider bringing down their gross exposures and their leverage and, and or holding more cash or you know, just sort of in general, you know, building a stronger arc for the inevitable unpredictability that's going to come because you, you have, I mean, we talked about this, I think a good bit going into the pandemic or last year, or I guess in the middle of it, but, you know, we had a period of calm where it was like for several years, it felt like all these earthquakes that were rumbling just beneath the surface never actually materialized and things were remarkably calm and quiescent and you could never seem to shake things up. But 
that doesn't seem to be the case anymore. So it's just sort of a reversion to the mean in that regard. So it's a good reminder. Yeah, Phil, if I may uh, just jump in on on that uh, notion that uh, Peloton should have communicated more forthrightly. Um, I feel like, you know, the, this is a little bit analogous to the concept of a pricing umbrella where, you know, if Apple prices the iPhone really highly, then the competitors have room to kind of raise their prices uh, as long as they stay well below that. And I just feel like uh, Elon Musk, uh, with his outrageous communications, has really raised the bar for what it means to be uh, disingenuous or outrageous in, in communicating with investors. So I feel like a lot of companies now think, you know, whatever Peloton did is, is kind of well within uh, those limits. Oh, it's very well within the limits. You're 100% correct about that. And it's funny because earlier today, uh, this was something else I'd planned to talk about, but I don't think we'll have time to get to. Earlier today, there was a a well-known company that held an investor day in which they sort of poked fun at themselves uh, using Elon kind of, you know, subtweeting him for lack of a better term, where they said that the corporate structure they had chosen was just a hustle, right? Which is a reference famously to when Elon was on Saturday Night Live earlier this year, and the writer somehow convinced him to admit that all of his crypto nonsense that he was promoting at, at uh, Tesla was just a hustle, right? That he didn't really believe it and that he's just kind of screwing around it. And I commented to somebody when this happened this morning, I'm like, yeah, this is the new Elon standard, right? That, you know, nothing should be taken on its face value. There's no such thing as candor and transparency and trust anymore. It's all a hustle. Everything's a simulation anyway, right? I think he genuinely believes that life is a simulation and we're all being controlled, you know, by a by an alien overlord, a galaxy over. And so screw it, right? I mean, it's it's stunning, but I, I think you're 100% right that that's the zeitgeist right now. Well, I, I don't know. Just to try to put myself in the shoes of Peloton's management, it's, to me, it seems a little more like Lehman saying, hey, guys, we don't need money. Um, but that was, you know, the goal of fending off a bank rush, which is a different beast. But, you know, when you need to raise money, you want your stock price to be as high as possible. And if you scream out, hey, yeah, we got to raise money, your stock's probably going to go down. Um, so you're better off doing it when you don't need it. Um, but yeah, you know, it's just a big mess. And I do think there is a degree to which corporate communication has gone the way of Elon Musk, for better or for worse, obviously for worse. But, but don't you think they would have, I mean, they, they just like anybody else could look forward and be like, okay, you know, we've gone from this incredible point of strength to one of potentially weakness now. Everybody's going to look at the liquidity situation here. We know we're going to get the question in two weeks as to whether or not we're going to raise capital. So if you think there's any chance you're actually going to pull the trigger on it, which they had certainly contemplated in the 14 days between when they said no or not and when they actually did it, why wouldn't you just do it before you get the question so you don't have to create this problem for yourself, right? Yeah, you yeah, absolutely. And it's a good opportunity. The capital because, raise with the results, right? It's simple. It's easy. I don't know if you read the release, overnight. but they basically read, read the uh, um, SEC filing, but they said specifically two, two investors inquired to fulfill the entire raise. I'm sure they did. That's what I mean. They could raise whatever they wanted overnight, probably. So why not just do it? Because the, the simple fact of the matter is like it, sophisticated investors are going to read the accounts and be like, boy, these guys probably need to raise capital at some point. And even though they just told me they're not, they're probably just deflecting or, you know, lying for for good reason, self-interested reason. But there's uh, who knows how many hundreds of thousands of retail investors that aren't going to know that, right, that are in this stock. And maybe they bought more when they said, no, we don't need to raise more capital. Right. And I, I just I don't know why you'd want to put yourself in that situation. If you're the and company. don't get a nice placement by having access. With yeah, they're never work exactly with brokers. I've, Correct. A brokered offering where they go directly to the company. My God, it must be nice. I have no way to substantiate this, but I bet there's a huge overrepresentation of retail shareholders at Peloton that are also customers. I anecdotally know a bunch of them myself, like people that thought. Right, wow, it's a I great thing in general, right? The cult-like so, companies that get those sorts of shareholders. It's awesome. So why it is? So why would you want to stick your finger in their eye? Right. I mean, it's just, I was wondering if Kendall tool was like a little more angry on my bike ride lately than usual. <laughs> it's mind boggling, right? Like it just seems so counterproductive, but anyway. Yeah. It's an interesting environment. That's for sure. Um, but I do think, you know, bringing it back to just the lack of predictability, 
it's one of those things I wonder how that manifests in like cost of capital, how that manifests in where companies are going to invest incremental dollars. Like we've had this basically, you know, kind of two decades where most investment was happening in the form of R&D and there was not much investment in physical capital. And our economy has, I don't know, kind of needed an investment in physical capital. And I think there are interesting consequences of that, both good and bad for different kinds of companies, if that actually does manifest. It's the kind of thing that a lot of people have been waiting a long time for. Um, and you could get certain kinds of efficiencies in areas that otherwise weren't there. All happening, I think one thing I didn't point out, uh, should have mentioned in above, was this whole uh, really tight labor market. Um, and I wonder the extent to which services reopening and ramping those workers who formerly were waiting tables got higher paying jobs at Amazon fulfillment that pay full benefits. Like, is there going to be short supply in some of these areas for a long time? And is there going to be a lot more investment in automation and just fundamental differences uh, going forward? I, I don't know. I, I feel like there's a, there's this question of, do we go to normal or do we, or is COVID a new normal, but maybe there's a new, new normal that we're on the brink of. Yeah, I think that's right. I think we're on a, the brink of a new normal as we always are, but this is an especially notable one and an especially difficult one to try to predict. And so I think there's little elements of it that are relatively easy to say that they're, you know, quite likely, not assured, but but very likely. And then there's broader, bigger questions like several that you've just raised that I think are almost impossible. That's why I ask you guys. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had better answers. Do we agree that this is going to be inflationary, other things equal? Um, do we agree on that or should we debate you that? You, you mean the, the COVID environment? I would debate that. I think okay. one of the foremost areas that's going to get investment is uh, automation. And you could get a degree of efficiency. Like One of the big mysteries out of the whole internet and web economy is that we have not had uh, increases in factor productivity. Like it just has been absent entirely. Um, although, I mean, maybe I'm, I, I, as I'm saying this out loud, I'm like, well, damn, we've had no increases in factor productivity and we've had this period of 20 years of disinflation. So maybe that's entirely wrong on its head. So I don't know. What about you guys? Yeah, I would debate it too, just from the standpoint that I think inflationary pressures are so obvious right now and they're being discussed so breathlessly, I'm just sort of naturally inclined to take the other side of it. And despite the fact that inflationary pressures are smacking us in the face every day and are so obvious to everyone, you still have the deepest and most liquid market in the world, the, the corporate or the government treasury market, you know, offering up a 10-year United States treasury at 1.6 and change as we record this. So I, I, I'm hesitant to really disagree as too much with that. I mean, what if the combination of investment and in automation and technology and the lack of a demographic tailwind and the removal of a couple of million workers from the U.S. workforce prematurely, potentially forever, what if all that does lead to more deflationary pressures or at least disinflationary pressures than we would have otherwise thought? So, uh, I mean, I'm obviously with you, John, I think where you were going, that the response to the COVID pandemic has been just this overwhelming wall of money thrown at the problem. And that is, of course, inflationary. And you're seeing the the first and second order effects of that right now. But I do think it's open to debate, at least in my mind. And I don't have a strong hot take on either side of it, but I am open to debate on both sides of it as to what the ultimate inflationary results are over, say, the next you know three to five years. And one more piece I'd throw at that is this idea that there's an asymmetry in the powers of the Fed right now um, in turn, in, insofar as they've been spending a decade trying to fight deflation. And we're kind of at the tail end of possibilities and what you can do to fend off incrementally more deflation than right now. Um, but in fighting inflation, there are a lot of tools at their disposal, starting with the unwind of some of the deflation fighting uh, forces and then raising interest rates. So I think they could put a lid on things a lot easier than they could reignite things. And so that's, you know, you want to be playing, uh, just thinking in terms of like managing a game, 
Like you want to be playing where you're, you corner your opponent where your tools are strongest. And so that's not the worst thing for the Fed. So maybe we get some inflation and we catch up on, you know, being subtrend for a bunch of years, but they could then put a lid on things. I, I think maybe I'm yeah, wrong. That's, but I think. that's good. I mean, it's a good argument. I, look, I think putting a lid on it would be super painful. And I wonder if anyone, at least in the US, has the political will to do it. I mean, I was talking about this the other day. Like, is there a Paul Volcker? alive today if it came to that point like I, it's kind of hard to imagine in the current environment that such a person exists but certainly i agree with you mechanically and that you know as we've seen in japan or even elsewhere as as we're partly seeing in in parts of europe or even in the us now with, with negative real yields um it, it doesn't work very well and you're pushing on a string to a large degree so but I, yeah i mean i certainly get nervous about walking this knife's edge of not too cold but not too hot and the fact that you know, government and treasury officials seem to believe that they can turn things up and down very precisely. Like it's a dial controlling a machine when we all know that's not how the economy really works. It's far messier and less precise than that. And uh, I, I just, I don't think anybody knows. So I'm, I'm hesitant to make any grand pronouncements about what's going to ultimately result. Yeah, I guess my hunch uh, and the reason for kind of throwing this out there was um, getting back to the discussion around, um, you know, putting more slack into supply chains and and so forth. Um, I feel like if you look at how supply chains were optimized over a period of decades where you had, you know, low cost labor producing things and it was being shipped uh, to the consuming countries in in America and and Western Europe. And if that's going to kind of reverse partly and you're going to have more domestic production and so forth, you're no longer capturing, um, you know, that differential in wages. And so I I feel like at least for that transition phase, uh, while you're putting in place the automation and so forth, um, and I think it could very well be inflationary uh, for a while until the new normal has been reached. Yeah, well, that I totally agree with. I think those are cases where you can boil it down maybe at an industry level and say, all right, we had a multi-decade tailwind from globalization and taking advantage of the wage differential, like you just said, and, and you know, stretching the supply chain as thin as it could possibly be stretched to wring out every dollar of margin and working capital efficiency that you could possibly generate. And if you're going to reverse that, at least partially now, then yeah, I totally agree. You're going to see wages go up, costs go up, margins go down. Uh, There's absolutely an an inflationary impact there for sure. So I I totally agree on that. I just don't know how that's going to balance out against kind of the other factors that may be cross currents at the same time. Well, Phil, uh, why don't we uh, go on to you? I know you have a related uh, topic to uh, to Elliot's. Yeah, sure. So I thought this was one of the most interesting business cases or reversals uh, in the past several years. I'm sure everybody's aware of it at this point. About two weeks ago, Zillow announced that they were going to be completely shutting down its iBuying offer, which they called Zillow Offers, which is where they would actually go and make a cash offer on the spot to buy your home. And then they would put in some kind of uh, paint and spackle kind of superficial repairs and then relist the home, you know, within a couple of months and, and try to crank up that uh, business as a way to compete against the incumbent way of selling homes, at least in the U S is still done largely through real estate agents that take anywhere from three to 6% of the total sale price as a commission. And so, you know, look, this was launched in 2018. There's a couple of other companies called OfferPad and Open Door that are that are still doing it, but it, it generated a lot of fanfare, right? I mean, this was uh, a pretty significant line item of revenue for Zillow. It was about 25% or more of their total workforce. Uh, it generated an outsized effect in terms of what people were ascribing to the company's future. Uh, both in terms of its profitability and and directly in its market cap. The company itself uh, predicted that it would scale up to at least $20 billion in annual revenue. Uh, And look, there there was reason to believe this was going to be successful. I mean, I, my mom's a realtor, my favorite aunt's a realtor. I'm sensitive to this, but it's a very inefficient model, right? And the National Association of Realtors in the U.S. really does act like a De Beers style cartel. (laughs) And, you know, it's like the NA. 
the NRA and the ARP lobbying group times two. Uh, it, it, it's not great. It's not efficient. Uh, it's it's outdated, in my opinion. So that there was good reason to to believe that this could be ses- successful. And, and the founder, Rich Barton, is a very successful, very smart guy. He started this 15, 16 years ago, I think the advertising and sort of lead generation business that they've built is very successful. And, and likewise, when they, one of the keys they unlocked there was the, the product they call the Zestimate, which is just an algorithm that generates an estimate of your price kind of by scraping uh, comps and publicly available data. And when they first started doing that, it was very inaccurate. And now they think they've got the median error bar down to like plus or minus 2% at the median. So that's pretty good. So if they can do that, why can't they do this, right? I mean, that, that, that was kind of the, the idea. And it turns out that this was just an absolute epic colossal failure because they now admitted that they can't even remotely forecast the price of homes in three to six months. And so the implications to this, I think, are, are, are fascinating. And if you dig into what they actually said, it's both understandable and kind of a head scratcher because they went from making too much money in the second quarter, right? So they were actually making about 575 basis points. And this is kind of a unit economic analysis. So it's not quite clear what all cost burdens they were associating with the business. But on their own math, they said, we don't ever want to make more than 200 basis points or lose more than 200 basis points on a given transaction at the median, because we don't want to feel, we don't want buyers or sellers to feel like they're getting screwed. And instead, in the second quarter, they were making 575 basis points, which is obviously way outside the 200 basis point range. So they said, all right, we need to tweak the models. We need to be more aggressive. We need to, and we need to buy more homes. They weren't, they didn't think they were buying enough homes. They weren't getting up to scale as quickly as they wanted. And you fast forward to this quarter, they estimate that they're going to lose five to 700 basis points. So it's like a 1200 basis point swing in the matter of a few months in the midst of, you know, granted an unusual housing market, but to their point, they just kind of woke up and realized like, hey, this isn't working out. We're not able to predict things. And if we ever do get to scale and we have these kinds of, vol- this kind of volatility, it's really going to be a problem because then you're talking about big numbers. I mean, just as it stands now, they have an ending inventory of about 9,700 homes, 9,800 homes, and they had to take a $304 million write down on the inventory in the third quarter. So, you know, and that's, you know, thousands of homes. I mean, the whole idea here is you have 110 million homes or whatever the, the housing stock would be that they could go after. Uh, so it, it really does become an issue. One thing that, that didn't sit quite right with me was that, you know, it, in one breath, they said, quoting from the, the conference call, at scale, we could put the whole company at risk, which I agree is a problem. But they went on to say, but it also just causes a ton of volatility in earnings, which is not a great look for a public company. And it's like, I hey, boy, I mean, that, that's not what they're here to do. I mean, who cares if it's just a little volatile in earnings? I mean, to me, the problem here is exactly what Elliot said, which is why I kind of chuckled in the first part there, is that this was just a lot harder than it looked. And when things went wrong, when there was a tiny change in assumptions, because Let's be honest. I mean, a couple of points difference. I mean, that that shouldn't sink the ship. You know, I'm I'm off every day by a couple of points. I mean, lots of people are off every day by a couple of points. Vegas is off by a couple of points every day, and saying that's why the vig is so much wider, right? That's why the bid ask is so much wider in markets, and that's why financial markets, I think, have learned to accept uncertainty and deal with volatility. And, and it's funny because what they what he then went on to analogize here was that they ended up looking a lot more like a leveraged trader in the market than what they wanted to be, which was a market maker. And so it it still stands to reason to me that there's a huge opportunity here for somebody that has the data, that has the technology, that has the willingness to spend tens or hundreds of millions of dollars to get up and running here to be a better market maker in the residential housing market, because the opportunity is just so enormous. And so I, I wonder what you guys think about why this failed, what the implications are. Uh, to, again, to me, I, I've already given the punchline away, which is just that the future has always been hard to predict and nothing changed here. And I remember thinking when they launched this initiative, you know, good luck. I, I hope somebody succeeds. I don't see how this is possibly going to succeed given the, the price that's implied in the in the publicly traded shares, right? From an investor perspective, I mean, it was just kind of amazing. I mean, people were capitalizing this thing 
at 10 to 15 times revenues when it was losing money hand over fist and was never going to make more than you know, a nominal amount of money. And they did call out, by the way, that another one of the fatal flaws they discovered in this business was that it was going to take a lot more capital and generate a lot less return on equity than they ever thought, which again, goes back to what we were just talking about a few minutes ago. Um, but look, I, Rich Barton and this team, they're no fools. They are exceptionally good. They've got a great track record. Uh, I commend them for trying. Um, it, it just seems like this was a little bit more predictable and things don't always work, right? I mean, Amazon's failed at plenty of things. Google's failed. At, you know, they've all failed. And so th this is just sort of life. And so I, I'm just kind of stunned at, at all these companies where a few months ago, it, it, as recently as February, the stock was trading at $200 a share. And today it's at 57. I mean, the peak market cap, uh, you, you've erased like $35 billion of peak market cap to where we are today just in a matter of what, eight months, nine months. And so, I mean, there were somewhere between two and six million shares trading hands between November of last year and November of this year. So for basically a full month, the average price was well above $100 a share. The average trading volume per day was well above 2 million, usually approaching three, four, five, six million. I mean, billions and billions of dollars changed hands on just completely ludicrous assumptions now in hindsight, assumptions that got blown completely out of the water in a very short period of time. And that's money that even if you're a long-term Zillow holder has likely been been lost for good or severely impaired on a present value basis. So um, I'll stop there and just ask you guys for other implications because another thing that, that boggles my mind about this is algorithms and, and this model of algorithmic buying and selling works so well in markets that are also incredibly prone to personal taste to unpredictable black swan events, right? I mean, algorithms work well in, you know, sports analytics, obviously commodities markets, stocks, bonds, all sorts of things. So why did this fail so spectacularly? All right. Well, you know, this is an interesting topic and I obviously just saw your message that this was what you're switching to. I'm sorry for blowing up your spot with, uh, you know, the first part. Um, no, it works great. I mean, it leads right into it. So. Right. <laughs> Excellent. So, you know, and I think it's a nice segue from last week. My muse for talking about the Kasparov principle was very much reading the human side of what went wrong at Zillow. Um, and, you know, I think a lot about this. I've thought a lot about this and I don't necessarily have clear answers, but you take a step back and it's like Barden's calling to come back to Zillow was he saw the opportunity in iBuying. And that was very much his vision when he went to start Zillow. Like the origin story, I mean, maybe it's the origin story, much like Reed Hastings talking about how, um, you know, he, he got his late fees from Blockbuster and he's like, enough's enough. And everyone knows that that's just not actually what happened at all. Um, but that was part of, Barden's origin story for Zillow, and he came back to make it happen. And then you think about the fact that Zillow effectively is the funnel for people's search in the real estate space. And if you do believe iBuying is a fundamentally good business, then there should theoretically be no one better positioned than Zillow to capitalize on it. And yet here we are, they're not even in the business anymore. And my understanding is not even was that decision made like two months after their CFO was like, we love this I buying business. We're all in on it. We're going uh, to buy a lot of homes and it's going to work. I, my understanding is that that morning or that within a day of their earnings, they made the choice to say, hey, we're out of this business entirely, which is just wild. Um, and you wonder like, how well it takes some balls on Barton's part to be able to like look in the mirror and say I came here to do this and I'm gonna just destroy it right now in one fell swoop and here's why and to be fair like the articulation of why aside from the um you know worrying about the volatility of their earnings is is somewhat fair like he saw where it might have snowballed into something that was way worse than merely losing money along the way. But from my seat, the loss was not that big, given the ambition, given where they said just a couple weeks before they thought it could go. 
And given their explicit willingness to test and learn along the way, what I really can't wrap my head around is why they didn't just say like, hey, you know, this sucked. We're going to retrench and we're going to start again at much smaller scale and make sure we got this model right. Because I do believe that iBuying is the future of home buying, at least in parts of this country. I think the process of buying a home is so bad and there's so much room to make it better. Um, that I, I I don't see any other way to move it forward other than something like that, that removes the friction. And the business model is not as new as it sounds. Like you could look at the history of executive relocation. It's been done successfully and profitably on a smaller scale in the past. Where I live, it strikes me as very challenging because there's not a single plot of land nor a house that look exactly the alike. But in the cookie cutter parts of America, okay, you know, like it it should very much work. And Open Door looks just fine. And in terms of the Kasparov principle, I'd say Open Door probably veers a little too far toward the pure algo rather than allowing humans opportunity to engage in the process. But I've got a lot of thoughts. I don't have a lot of answers. Yeah, I mean, so that's what another thing that's so interesting about this to me is is you're right. That's part of why they picked Phoenix, my old home ground and my own hometown and stomping grounds. And that's why it was appealing to them was there was so much uniformity amongst the houses, right? I, I hate to say cookie cutter, but there was a lot of comparability between houses and they caught a housing market where it was just going up, right? I mean, to call it volatile is true, but it was just going up. And so it went up a lot and, and largely because of COVID factors. And so they, they got it wrong, but like, yeah, how is that? And so what I think they realized, to your point, I, I tend to agree, there has to be a future for some of this. It's just, they think they can't get it done at scale. And I tend to agree on the sen- in the sense that you can't get it done at scale without having some horrendously low returns on capital. And I think it's going to take longer and be harder. And look, there, there's just all sorts of things like this, where you look at the rating agencies or or, you know, in certain aspects of the payments systems in this country or the world where it's like, you know, there has to be a better way to do this. And it's like, well, yeah, if it was really that easy, we would have fixed it by now. So I I think there was a slightly different problem that got mentioned, but subtly, which is when you look at the Zestimate and you think about it, right, that's not what drove their algo. But if you want to buy someone's home from them and they look at Zillow, they're like, well, I don't want to take an offer less than my Zestimate. But then if you want to go find a buyer, it's like, well, I don't want to pay more than this estimate. So they, I I forgot the exact quote, but Barton said something about the integrity of the brand Zillow, having had a very high affinity with their customers, uh, customers, not the people that actually pay them, but the people in the funnel that go to their site regularly. And the word he used was, you know, having to negotiate with them in the most emotional decision of their lives, right? And I think that's one of the reasons why instead of just trying to refine the model, they're like, well, actually, from where we sit, we may have thought we were on top of the funnel, but we actually are disadvantaged in trying to go down this path. Well, yeah, they did say, and, and this is a thought that seems obvious in hindsight, it's it's kind of funny, it didn't occur to them earlier. They, they claim they're only able to serve like 10% of their customers successfully in terms of the ones that came to them very seriously interested in using the Zillow offers product to buy their home, right? And so if they disappointed 90% of those people, that's obviously not great for the rest of the business, right? And that's a very valid concern. But why that didn't come up earlier, I mean, I I guess they thought they could just serve, uh, they thought it'd be 90-10 the other way. I don't know. But um, it it was bizarre. But I think another really interesting point that you made earlier was that Yes, this is emotional, but there's lots of emotional products. Psychology rules the day and everything. The endowment effect is very real, whether you're buying or selling, you know, a car, a house, a fancy piece of artwork, a coffee mug, whatever the case may be. So I don't think that goes all the way um, in explaining it. And then the other thing that I think is so interesting is where these methods have really worked is where they're both well suited for the environment and people go all in. In this case, you know, halfway down the road. Zillow hired at least 100 people to kind of intervene on a human basis. And they check photographs and look for curb appeal and natural light and all this stuff that can't really be quantified in the algorithm. 
And then they had the problem where the people were both overriding and being overridden too much. I mean, so to me, that just speaks to an algorithm that's not really being allowed to function as an algorithm, right? And I've seen this all the time in finance and investing, and it works horribly. And then when you have people like Renaissance that are amazing at writing that type of code and letting the machine do its job, they obviously get great results and they stick to their knitting and they've generally not had a problem. So to say the least. So uh, it's a multifaceted issue that I just find fascinating. Yeah, I'm not super familiar with uh, with the particular situation here, but I feel like, um, you know, let's say the Zestimate um, being an issue, you know, maybe they should just show a Zestimate range or show the seller a, a bid of sorts and show others an ask. And then there's room for negotiation within that. Um, so there would be ways uh, to fix this. Uh, it just sounds to me like they moved way too quickly on this um, eye buying and just did not allow enough time to build some kind of a data set and, and enough experience. Um, but it does sound like it should be workable. That said, I feel like fundamentally, um, they it, it makes sense to stay closer to being a market maker than kind of a prop trader. So, you know, as a seller of a house, um, it's obviously great if you can just have it sold in a day. Um, and then as, as Zillow, I feel like they should kind of be pretty certain that they can sell that house within a reasonable time frame and only then uh, kind of bid for it. So I, I don't know if they were looking at this, but I'd basically be looking at some sort of inventory turnover metric and make sure that, that that's you know, pretty high and that you're not holding these homes for too long. I mean, it's almost like Amazon uh, kind of pre-positioning product um, that they are pretty certain is going to get ordered by someone in some location. Um, they're not going to pre-position product unless they have some certainty that within a pretty short period of time, that product is going to get shipped. And, and, and I think if you apply a similar principle here, you know, Zillow, if you, if, if you just buy one home in Phoenix, you, you're going to get that sold pretty quickly. So it's just a matter of staying low enough on the volume, at least initially, um, to, to make sure that you don't get stuck with uh, inventory as the market turns. And so yeah. that's, yeah. That, that's actually funny because that's exactly the, the point that Matt Levine made in his column today at Bloomberg, which we've talked a little bit about before. I highly recommend it. It's one of the best things I read every day, bar none. And his point was that like you need to just have so little scale that you can do this and still make money, which is an awesome business. But if you try to get big, which is what a company like this needs to do and what seemingly all big companies want is to get size and scale right away as quickly as possible, then it becomes unmanageable. And it's fascinating, right? He's like, if I had the capital to do this with 10,000 homes, I'd do it in a heartbeat, right? That'd be awesome. But it's not going to work if you try to do it with too many homes too quickly. And it's just uh, bizarre. One other thing I'd add real quickly is that, look, I don't think I, as good as the track record, I'm not trying to say like, oh, congratulations, you lit, you know, a billion or two dollars on fire and torched your market cap and all that. I, my point was that problems happen, failures happen. You're not going to knock everything out of the park, no matter how good you are. And so in this case, I do think it's worth, uh, you know, we, I was pretty harsh earlier on corporate disclosure and governments or in governance. In this case, you know, they made a decision. I wasn't aware of the, the CFO's prior comments, but when they made a decision, they disclosed it. They disclosed it immediately. I read the shareholder letter they put out with it, the presentation, the conference call they did with it. I thought it was transparent. I, if I were in the CEO's shoes, I would feel horrible. I think he expressed that he feels horrible. I mean, you, you hate the, the construct here of laying off 2000 people, right? I mean, that really sucks. And I'm sure he feels horrible about it. And it, it you know, you dust yourself off and you move on. And, and that's the kind of good faith effort that I think we can and all should be tolerant of. Yeah, and maybe just a, a thought. And Elliot, I'd love your input on this kind of going back to the Kasparov principle. Um, it just seems to me like uh, 
right now investors are putting really high valuations on anything that has a purely algorithmic process. And they're really not valuing uh, that human input component at all because there's a perception that it's not scalable and that you really must not have a good enough algorithm if you need humans. Um, and that might be a driver for why a company like Open Door would basically at least portray itself as being almost all algorithm uh, because you probably get a higher multiple that way. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of those uh, companies have found gravity in the last few months, much like Zillow and uh, Peloton. But I do think there's a degree to which there's this uh, allure to things that are purely digital, um, that are purely algorithmic in nature. And to an extent, it makes some sense, right? Some of the best business models ever are built that way. <laughs> Look at Google, right? It basically is just an algo. So much so that they have to invest in other things just to make it look like they're not, I don't know, for whatever reason, as high margin as they could be just running uh, search. Um, but yeah, and I think you that's know. what's so interesting. I don't mean to interrupt. Like, but that's what I think is so interesting. It's like, you're right. I, I totally agree with what you said earlier. It's like, this is so promising. Like an eye buying type of program makes so much sense relative to the status quo. If anybody's going to pull it off, of course, it's going to be Zillow. And it flopped on its face, like it utterly oh. failed. And so like that seems to me like the, the rule of the day is like, if there's any premise to it, I'll pay almost any price for it. And then this is what you end up getting, <laughs> right? Well, so that, uh, I, I mean, before getting to that directly, I think it's partly, John said something about, you know, why not just be a market maker by actually getting buyer and seller together instead of... Um, instead of actually buying the houses to then sell. And what's interesting about that, and I think part of why Zillow was disadvantaged relative to Open Door, is their business is actually selling ads to brokers. And so they make money from brokers today. So how do you disintermediate and cannibalize yourself that <laughs> severely, right? Well, yeah, good point. So, but I mean, have, when you, you own the funnel, that might be, if you could start unencumbered by any past and you start Zillow and build traffic accordingly, maybe that's what you do instead of getting brokers to pay for leads through your site. <laughs> that sounds a little bit like the innovator's dilemma. I mean, if they're afraid to do something that's right, you know, Elliot, you said you you believe in eye buying or some form of that. Um you know, and maybe Zillow is now going to be defending a, a model that might fail over time. Who knows? It's definitely something that they must be contending with. And I do think Barden at least alluded to better to cannibalize yourself than to be cannibalized. And he's very cognizant of innovators dilemma. So I don't think he's, you know, not thinking about where they are vulnerable and where they could be outflanked. Right. Um, and I do think part of you know, Phil, to your point about candid communication, I, I think one of the things that was quite candid as well was not just the bluntness of the message of why they were getting out of it and what they feared, but also the lack of, um, this is exactly where we're going. This is our roadmap. Because typically when you spent a year saying, or two years saying, this is the direction we're traveling, and you very recently keep affirming that direction, you'd expect to say like, okay, this is the new plan from here. <laughs> Um, but the swiftness of the decision, I think, was a big part of why that wasn't wasn't there at all. Okay, great. Well, guys, this was another uh, terrific discussion. I hope everyone listening enjoyed it as well. Uh, we will be off next week uh, for Thanksgiving week. So I want to wish everyone a happy uh, Thanksgiving. Uh, you guys want to chime in as well with your wishes real quick? Yeah, I wish everybody a good and restful Thanksgiving next week and looking forward to be back the following. Yeah, no, thank you all for listening. We've gotten great feedback and direct messages, emails, etc. It's been a pleasure doing this and getting to know some of the audience as well. So, you know, happy and healthy and a lot to be thankful for as things are uh, much different than they had been the past year. So uh, enjoy the time with your families and we'll reconnect uh, early in December. Terrific. So speak with you in just about two weeks. Take care for now. 
Thank you for listening to This Week in Intelligent Investing, brought to you exclusively by MOI Global, the research-driven membership organization. Learn more at moiglobal.com.